I do. I, and it's even on, right, Mike? How's everybody doing? Is that like just the answer that you're supposed to give to a preacher? Or are you really good? No, no, really. <laughs> that rain, wonderful rain. Thank you, Arthur and Jenny and Eric and Henry. Thank you, Mike, for your part in all this, to have them here and being a part of uh, this, you know, to pull into the parking lot and hear the worship being celebrated already before there's even people here. Tells me there's a deep commitment to that. You people are very lucky to have these people that are willing to do that. So make sure you let them know. Thank you for that. And I think it's really neat the way um, you people pray for your pastor while she's gone. Um, I, you guys know I retired after 42 years of preaching at the Church of Christ in Plainview, and there were a, a lot of, I, I, after 42 years, I finally, I started out with one week of vacation, you know, and you work it up, and finally I got up to where, you're not going to believe this, but five weeks of vacation, eh? That's what 42 years will get you. Just so you know, the new pastor started with six weeks, just so, <laughs> it wasn't fair. Um, but anyway, there were a lot of vacations, and oh, by the way, my wife Helen was able to come today, so make sure you say hi to her. She, a lot of times when I'm preaching here, she's um, leading worship back in, the, in Plainview. But uh, there was a lot of vacations that would get interrupted because things came up, you know, a funeral or uh, a crisis that we had to either delay vacation or come back early. So uh, they're, they're very necessary, um, as all of you would know, but um, pastors are pretty much 24-7, <laughs> and so to get a vacation, to get out of town, and to get away, and to be rested, doesn't mean while you're gone, you're not thinking about praying about and worrying about the flock, but at least you're a chance to get renewed, and the fact that you're praying that she comes back renewed and refreshed, that's exciting, because God will give you that, and that'll affect the body as well. Tell me about the steeple, what's the deal? You're putting a new one up, or fixing the old one, or... Where? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So I'm all right over here. I don't want to get my hair wet. See, that's my... So it'll be fine? Yeah, three inches of rain I got, so that's... That. So this $10,000 will fix that leak? Are you doing the work? You're not? Okay, well... A steeple man is. Oh, okay, that's good. I didn't know they were steeple man. That's... Oh, it has. Leaks bad. I mean, I'm not a height person, so I wouldn't. Hey, this Celebrate Recovery you guys are doing, that is an awesome ministry. Thank you for doing that. I, we, we've got that at our church, and I got to tell you, it is one of the most powerful feeder programs, ministries, that feeding people into the body. I mean, we've got a ton of people now that are members of the church because they came through the door of the Celebrate Recovery, so God bless you for that. There's, there are people who, um, who desperately want to change their life and know that God can do that through Christ, and uh, it, it, it's exciting. So God bless you people for doing that. Um, open your Bibles to Matthew 24, um, or open your phones. <laughs> when, I, when phones first came out with Bibles on them, it bugged me when I was the preacher. It's like, use your Bibles, people, but now... <laughs> I go to church with my phone now because <laughs> I'm just so much easier to just pull it up that way. So whichever it is, the sermon just got shorter, just so you know, because this all fell down. Um, put it like that. Um, I want to preach about a topic that is probably the passage and, and the text, this and in Luke 16. One of the most disturbing passages in the Bible. And I got to ask you to pray for me and with me before I share what I want to share because um, this is a disturbing section of Scripture. And um, I need your prayers for that. So let's pray because... I have nothing significant to say, but God does. And if he'll speak through me, then we might get something done here. Father, we come before you, beholding your word, knowing the truth that's in it is truth you have for us this day. 
We ask that you would anoint this time with the presence of your Holy Spirit so that we would know the truth and only your truth. And Father, if I speak words that are not true, may these people not hear them or remember them. But Father, if the words that come out are your words and they are truth, may we leave this place transformed, changed because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever seen... Let's go back uh, one more. There you go. Have you ever watched when you get on an airplane? Um, Eric, are you getting on an airplane tomorrow? You are. You're, you're going to Los Angeles, right, tomorrow? Okay. When that attendant gets up there to give this speech, you listen, okay? Because you were in church today. What do people do? And I'm guilty of the same thing. This information is life saving, potentially the most important information they can get. Well, what are they doing? They're messing with their luggage. They're putting on their earbuds, listening to their texting, they're reading magazines or newspapers. Uh, they're talking to everybody else. They're doing everything but listen. All right? Now, what if the airline attendant would get a little more drastic? What if on those little screens on the seats in front of you, the attendant would start showing images of a burning airplane and people trying to get off? What if they'd show an airplane landed in water, going down, and people scrambling to try to get out? Well, what if this attendant would walk up and down the aisle, snatching magazines out of people's hands and smacking them on the head and say, you listen, this is important information, it's life-saving information. Well, they'd get fired, wouldn't they? Because that's not acceptable. Even though the information he or she is giving could save their lives. God has done the same thing for us, and his motivation for that is his love for us. So now let's go to that Matthew passage, and let's take a look at what it says. In those days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying, and, and giving their children to be married until the day Noah entered the boat. They knew nothing about what was happening until the flood came and destroyed them. It will be the same when the Son of Man comes. Interesting passage. You've probably known it was in the Bible. You've probably read it before. Or you've heard a sermon on it, the comparison between the flood of Noah and the second coming of Christ. And there are some comparisons then. In the time of Noah, people didn't believe it was going to rain and flood. There's some people suggest that up until that time, it had never rained before. Maybe. So they didn't believe it was going to happen, let alone flood. And so they didn't pay attention. A lot of people don't believe Christ could have come back, and so they don't pay attention. In the time of Noah, God provided a safe place for those who did believe, and that was to be on the ark. In the time of Christ, when he comes, there'll be a safe place, and that is for those who are in Christ. At the time of Noah, those who weren't in the safe place when the rain and the flood started screamed, cried, panicked, died. The time of Christ, those are not in a safe place in Christ. The scripture says there will be the, 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 the weeping and gnashing of teeth because of what they miss out on. Interesting comparison. Hell is a serious topic, and it's one we like to avoid. It's one we would just as soon not even talk about. C.S. Lewis once said, there is no doctrine which I would be more willing to remove from Christianity than hell, if it lay my power. I would pay any price to be able to say truthfully, all will be saved. We want to avoid the subject of hell. It's not a comfortable one to preach about. Because we don't want our parishioners to come to church and feel uncomfortable. So we don't like to preach on this topic. People don't like to hear about this topic, but I'm not your preacher. You can't fire me. You can just make sure she doesn't invite me back. So I'm going to ask three questions about the topic of hell today. And the first one is, does hell have a purpose? Does hell serve a purpose at all? I want you to think about this. If we were to remove all notions of hell from Holy Scripture, two things would happen. One, we'd be left with a God who's not just. And two, we'd be left with 
scriptures that are not trustworthy. Um, I want you to, to, to follow me on this, this for a second. I think it's sequentially, let's do it this way. Okay. If there's no hell, follow me if you can, um, God can't be just. If there's no punishment for wrong, if there's no punishment for evil, then God isn't a just God. So if there's no hell, God's not just. And if there's no hell, if there's no punishment for evil, then heaven doesn't really care. Heaven has to turn its back on terrorists and murderers and child molesters and rapists. If there's no hell, God can't be just. Heaven has to not care, turning its back on all of those who are begging for relief from those things. And if there's no hell, God can't be love. Because if there's no punishment for evil, and if love hates that which is evil, then God's not love. Does hell have a purpose? Yeah. It means that we have a just God and we have a, a trustworthy scripture. The New Testament is a virtual storehouse of information on evil. No one speaks about eternal punishment. Nobody in the Bible spoke about eternal punishment more than Christ did. Did you know that 13%, did you know that the screen can go blank at any time? 13% of all the red letters, you know the red letters are the words of Jesus, are about eternal punishment and hell. 13% of all the recorded words of Jesus are about that. One half of the parables, more than half of the parables, are about eternal damnation and hell. And yet we don't like to talk about it. We don't like to acknowledge that. Um, Mark, Mark 16, 16. Let's put it up here so you don't have to look it up. It says... Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But anyone who does not believe will be punished. Okay, see if I can put that into a more personal side for you. This may be hard for some of you to believe, especially my bride. But when I was little, there were times my father felt it was necessary to reprimand me. It was probably my brother's fault, but I got blamed for it. And he would say... Chuck, go to your room. I did not like those words. Go to your room. That was a place of punishment. <laughs> and as soon as my father said, go to your room, my backside began to throb instantly. Now, my father loved me. And I knew he loved me, and I loved him. And most of the time, that love relationship we had kept me from doing wrong because I didn't want to disappoint his love. But sometimes, <laughs> it wasn't enough. But the fear of being sent to my room <laughs> and being punished, that would help, and that would correct me. So if my love didn't compel me, my fear corrected me. Does that make sense? So sometimes I did right because I, I loved my father, and I knew he loved me. But sometimes I just didn't want to get that whooping. <laughs> I didn't want to go to my room. Well, God does that same thing with us. And um, most of the time, that's enough. The fact that we know that he loves us. So there's things we don't do just because we don't want to disturb that love relationship. But sometimes the lure of lust or the grip of greed or the promise of power, those things get too much and we sometimes step down into roads that we shouldn't be on. And then we hear the Holy Spirit say, go to your room. And so sometimes knowing that God loves us is enough to keep us on the right road. But sometimes the thought of a place like hell is even more than enough. So when our love for God doesn't compel us, sometimes our fear of punishment, maybe sometimes that corrects us. Jesus gives us that reminder in Luke 16. Now this one is that one that I said is probably the most disturbing story in the Bible. So if, remember, you can't fire me, so I get to go here. Look, look at that. We're going to answer the question, what is hell like? Okay, this is our second question. Does hell have a purpose? Yep. 
It reminds us of the justness of God and the love of God. But what is hell like? Okay, interesting. Jesus is the only eyewitness of hell who ever walked on earth. All right? Um, and his description of hell stands as the most reliable, as well as the most graphic description ever written. Ever written, and every single word of this Luke 16 account is, is significant. So let's dive in. There was a rich man who always dressed in the finest clothes. He lived in luxury every day. And a very poor man, his name was Lazarus, whose body was covered with sores, was laid at the rich man's gate. He wanted to eat only the small pieces of food that fell from the rich man's table, and the dogs would come and lick his sores. Yummy, let's eat, huh? All right, the story begins on Pill Hill. All right, here's a man who is living in the lap of luxury. He's got the finest clothes, he's got the finest house, he's got the finest household furnishings, he's got the best of the food. He's literally on Pill Hill living in the lap of luxury. Now, outside of his door, there's another man. His, he's given a name. It's Lazarus. And Lazarus um, is a beggar. His body's covered with sores, and the dogs come and they lick his wounds. Good stuff. He was purposely put at that gate. So I mean, somebody cared enough to put him in a wagon or in a cart and bring him to this rich man's house. Why? Well, here's why. And it's a strange reason, but it's a valid reason. In those days, the rich people didn't use linen napkins to, to, to wipe when they ate. They would, they would use, this is documented proof from history, they would use a bread-like substance and they would wipe their hands and wipe their face with it, and they'd throw it out. And the dogs would eat it. Well, Lazarus just wanted a crumb from whatever the dogs didn't eat. That's all he was hoping for. So the thrown out, discarded waste of the rich people became the food, the fodder for the dogs and, and the food f for this, this poor man. But you've got to look at the contrast here. This is amazing. Here you've got a nameless tycoon basking in the lap of luxury, and here you have a named beggar who's, who's living a life of misery. So the rich man, we don't have a name. This beggar gets a name. His name is Lazarus. So it says, later, Lazarus died. Okay? Now this is where the story, we're starting to ramp up here. Lazarus died, and the angels carried him to the arms of Abraham. The rich man died too, and was buried in the place of the dead, and he, in that place of the dead, was in much pain. Okay, here's where it starts ramping up. The beggar, who had nothing but God, now he's got everything. The rich man, who had everything but God, now has nothing. The beggar's body, probably in that time, would have been taken outside and thrown in the dump. That's what they would have done with his body. Um, outside of Jerusalem, um, they had a garbage heap. And it would be on fire all the time as they were trying to burn the waste. So they kept it hot, kept it burning. And it, its name is actually Gehenna, which means hell, place of hell, place of torment. So that... Poor man's body would have been taken out and thrown into Gehenna to be burned up. All right? The rich man probably was put in a very nice tomb, and he was probably anointed with priceless oil. All right? So you see the difference? This one's thrown away. This one is elaborately buried. Well, the story goes on. Jesus now kind of escorts us over to the edge of hell. <laughs> And he gives us a look at something that ought to disturb us all. Okay? He goes over to the edge of hell and he shows us the horrors. This rich man is in relentless torment, constant pain, terrible pain. In fact, 
In five verses, there's four references to pain. Let's look at them. In this place of the dead, the rich man was in much pain. The man says, I am suffering in this fire. And the scripture says, now Lazarus is comforted here, and you, you're suffering. I have five brothers, the rich man says. And Lazarus could go and warn them so that they will not come to this place of pain where I am. So this rich man basically describes where he is as a place of pain, constant, endless torment. Every fiber of his being is being tortured. And what's worse is he can look up and see what he'll never, ever, 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 ever have. And he gets to see this beggar who once sat outside his gate every day. And that beggar is not experiencing pain. Let's look at the next part of this. The rich man saw Abraham far away. Um, and Lazarus next to him. So Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham. He's right there in, in, in his arms. He called, Father Abraham, would you please have mercy on me? Get this. This is how miserable he is. Send Lazarus, dip his finger in some cool water and just touch. Touch my tongue because I'm suffering in this fire. How miserable are you that one drop of cool water would feel that good? You know, this is how tormented he is. You know, I was thinking about hell might be tolerable if God would just give us all a lobotomy. <laughs> you know, if he'd just stir up our brains <laughs> and so we could not feel pain or suffering. But that's not the case at all. It says the people there ask questions. They're able to speak. They're able to beg and plead. I think of all the torments of hell, the worst might be the knowledge that this is an eternal punishment. Um, well, here's what it says. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The same adjective that's described the duration of hell is used to describe the duration of, of our heavenly reward, eternal. So that man, what he was suffering, will never go away. I was talking to Lee a little bit before church. That man is bionic. Did you know that? His whole right side is metal. He could probably just get up and leap home from here. He's just. Can you imagine what pain he's gone through in his short life? Imagine pain constant, never ending, never going away, no hope of it ending, and being able to see what you can't have. So that brings us to the last question, okay? Because I know I'm making you uncomfortable. Fire me. <laughs> I've. I've never been fired. That would be an interesting thing. How could a loving God send people to hell? Does hell have a purpose? Yep, it shows us the justness of God and the love of God. What is hell like? It's a place of pain and torment, and it's eternal. Well, then how could a loving God, full of grace, send anything he created to hell? That's an honest question, isn't it? It's probably one you've been asked as you've shared Christ with other people. And it may even be one on occasion you've asked. So it's a legitimate question. I don't know the answer. Let's wait for Colleen to get home. And let's, no, <laughs> I, do, I do want to give you what I think is the answer to that. Um, and, and the question itself reveals a misconception. Why? How could a loving God send people to a place of torment? That's a misconception. God does not send anyone to hell. Okay? God doesn't send anyone to hell. He simply honors their choice. Um, see if you can listen to this. It's a, it's, a, it's a packed sentence. Hell is the ultimate expression of God's high regard for the dignity of man. Let me, we'll unpack it, but let me say it again. Hell is the ultimate expression of God's high regard for the dignity of man. God 
never chooses anybody. It forces anybody to choose him. God never forces anyone to choose him, even if that means they might choose hell. All right? C.S. Lewis wrote, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who have said to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, thy will be done. All that are in hell have chosen it. And God, in his love for mankind, honors their choice. Even if that means they choose hell. God doesn't send anyone to hell. He simply honors the choice of sinners to not pick him, to not choose him. Well, the story's not over. It's got an incredible twist at the end. You've got to see this twist. You already know it. You've been in enough classes. The rich man begins to plead with God. What does he say? Please send Lazarus to my father's house. I've got five brothers. And what we can do is have Lazarus warn them about this place and how bad it is so that they won't have to come to this place of pain too. That's interesting. All of a sudden, this rich man is possessed with an evangelistic fervor. <laughs> this guy who had no time for God before is now praying for missionaries. All right? Interesting twist. I guess you would have to say it's pretty remarkable what one step into hell can do for your priorities. <laughs> Changes a lot of things. And you know what? I think that the truth of that should challenge every one of us who know what we have in heaven and what the horrors of hell are like to do everything possible we can to make sure the people that we love and care about never go there. To say whatever we have to, even if that's awkward and embarrassing, you know what's ahead of them. If they don't choose Jesus, do whatever it takes. Double and redouble your efforts to make sure they never spend a second in that place of torment. Um, Jesus knew the flood of, of wrath that hell would bring. In fact, he knew it so much that he said, you need to do whatever is necessary to make sure you never go there. Here's how he said it. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Throw it out. It's better that you enter into eternal life maimed and lame than to go into hell with two feet and two hands. To be thrown into that eternal place of pain and torment completely intact. I mean, that, he's getting pretty serious about this. And anyway, he says, I'd rather see you come into heaven without your arms and your feet or your eyes or your ears or anything that's going to lead you away from me. Get rid of it. Than to go into hell fully intact and spend eternity there. Well, this story is without a doubt the most disturbing story Jesus ever told. Um, it uses words like torment, pain, eternal suffering. It also teaches us a very vital truth we could easily overlook if we weren't careful. Let me explain this. This story teaches us about the unimaginable love of God. Huh? <laughs> How can that be? Let me say that again. This story teaches us about the unimaginable love of God. Okay, I'll explain According to 1 Peter chapter 3, do you know what Jesus did when he died on the cross, after he died on the cross? Yeah, it says that he was escorted into hell. There's a theological study for you sometime. That he was escorted into, he, would, he, would, he spanned the chasm. Why would Jesus go to hell in that moment after his death on the cross? So you and I wouldn't have to. <laughs> That's an unimaginable love. That God would take his only begotten son and heap on him all of our sin and send him to hell so that you and I wouldn't have to go there. Look at 2 Corinthians. Here's what it says. You know it, but just let me remind you. Christ had no sin. But God made him to be sin. How? By putting all of our sin on him. 
All the sin that came before the cross, all the sin at the time of the cross, and all the sin that would ever come after the cross was all heaped on Jesus when he was on that cross. And he became grotesque because sin is ugly. And he became something that God detests. He became sin, which God hates. God detests sin. And his only begotten son became so, so ugly from sin that God sent him to hell. For a moment, so that we wouldn't have to go there. Is this not a story about God's most unimaginable love? That he would take the son he loves, that he, he's well pleased in, and send him to hell carrying all of our sins. That's a love story if I ever heard one. Yeah, hell's misery is deep, but it's not as deep as God's love. So, what do we do about this? How do we apply this? A sermon's of no value if the pastor doesn't give you some application. And I think it's pretty obvious and pretty simple. If you know what you have in Christ because you've asked Christ to be your Savior, you said, I can't save myself, I need a Savior, and you've asked him into your heart to be that Savior, and you've committed yourself to, to walk with him, and out of your love for him, you... You stay away from some sins, and out of your fear of rejection in hell, you stay away from even more sins. Then you need to rejoice, because what you have is eternal. But it also ought to cause those of us who know that to do everything possible, to take every opportunity available and tell people, you don't want to be there. <laughs> don't choose Jesus so you don't have to have that. And if you're somebody who is still on the fence and you have not done that, I don't know your individual lives, or maybe you're ministering to somebody who's right there, oh, man, run to the cross <laughs> fast and say, Jesus, I can't do this alone. I need a Savior. That's one of the things I love about Celebrate Recovery. Most of those people are right there. They've tried it on their own. They've tried, done the best they can, and they've seen how much a failure they are, and they need a, a higher power that they've decided was for them, Jesus Christ. A couple of years ago, maybe more than that, if I think it's two years ago, it's probably 10 years ago, I was on vacation with my older brother who was raised, our father was a pastor, so he was raised in the same environment I was. And he came to the conclusion that he hated that my, he doesn't go to church, has nothing to do with that or God. He hated that he was forced to go to church. You know, as a child, I was drugged. I was drugged to church. I was drugged to Bible study. I was drugged to Sunday school. <laughs> and I came to the conclusion, thank you, Mom and Dad, that you love me enough to drag me there. He came to the conclusion that I don't want anything to do with it because you made me do it. And in a conversation with him while on vacation, he said, Chuck, let me ask you this. What if, in the end, you're wrong? I said, well, then what did I lose? That means I wasted my time being nice to people, loving them, giving of what I have to help them, trying to lead them to be better people. I guess that's what I lost. And I said, but what if I'm right and you're wrong? What do you lose? You lose eternity. And of all of the theological, my theological undergraduate study, my theological seminary study, my master's degree, of all the things I was taught I'm supposed to say that are supposed to brilliantly change lives, that would did more than anything for him. What if I'm right and you're wrong? And that gave him pause to think, yeah, I guess I lose a lot. They call sermons like this fire insurance. The only reason I picked Jesus because just in case that stuff's right and I, I'm buying a little bit of fire insurance for hell. That's not what I want you to think from this sermon. No, I choose to not sin because of my love for God, but sometimes I still sin, and um, that's when I worry about a place of punishment. But in Christ, I don't have to have that worry. And I have an assurance that I want everyone to have, that that's not have to be a concern for me. 
And it's my prayer that if you're not there, today will be the day. Would you pray with me? Father, you are awesome in all that you do, in all your ways. Father, this is a, a sermon passage that we don't like to talk about. It makes us uncomfortable. And Satan's already working to try to, to get us to write it off or to believe it's just a really good lesson story. Father, when we leave this place, may we know the truth of the horrors of a place of eternal punishment. And may we say thank you for the blessing of eternal joy in you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Would you please stand sing the last song with us? His grace is enough.